are located in a very important place in New York City on an axis that leads from the Statue of Liberty to the World Trade Center site. And the museum draws strength from those two powerful symbols. I imagine my great-grandfather arriving at Ellis Island, and I wonder whether when he arrived by ship there in the latter part of the 19th century, whether he could have dreamt that someday there would be a museum just across the water that would tell his story. Our museum is devoted to telling the story of 20th century and, in fact, 21st century Jewish history. We are a Holocaust museum that provides the all-important context to this history. And then we tell this very dramatic story of the rebirth of life and community and the power to rebuild after great tragedy. Our core exhibition defines us as an institution. There are always rotations of new artifacts, but the message remains consistent. The quotes that are chiseled into the wall that faces you as you begin the journey are so important in defining what this museum is all about. One says, remember, never forget, focuses on the past. And the other quote says, there's hope for your future. We started in the 1880s when there was a tremendous migration of Jews from Europe to the United States and elsewhere. And the goal of the first floor is to talk about the tremendous vitality of Jewish life and the variety of Jewish life. And we do this to the extent that we can by using authentic artifacts that belong to people, that were parts of their lives. And in many cases, our objects have two stories. The story that they played in the history that we tell, but also the story of how they got to the museum. The Steinberger Sukkah was created by a man living in Hungary before the Second World War. And during the Holocaust, it was hidden from the Nazis. And when the family left Hungary in 1956, one of the things they took with them was the Sukkah. For the next 25 years, it was in a closet in a Brooklyn apartment. Until one of our curators went looking, were, were somehow in a drugstore, and the druggist learned they were looking for important artifacts. And he said, well, my mother has my grandfather's sukkah upstairs. The Ferdinand and Isabella letter is probably the oldest artifact in the exhibition. It, it's dated 1492, and it's a letter that deals with the distribution of Jewish property that has been expropriated. And the purpose of it, obviously, is to show there is a long prehistory to many of the things that happened to the Jews in the 20th century. And uh, for many people, especially the date 1492, has a kind of important resonance. The last gallery on the first floor gives the crucial context in the, the minds and hearts of the Jewish community before the Holocaust. Some had dreams of life in, in Israel. Some had dreams governed by the tenets of Orthodox Judaism. Some guided by socialist principles. And others felt that their future held a life of assimilation and connection with their with the countries in which they live. So the future was varied and different from, for everyone. The second floor is dedicated to the darkest history of our time, and it begins with the rise of Nazism and its impact on the Jewish community. But again, we tell it from the Jewish point of view. What happened when Jews were systematically excluded from public life? What happens when they lost their jobs or when they were forced to leave their schools, forced to leave their professions, not knowing, of course, what the future would bring? Well, they built parallel organizations. They built their own schools, their own orchestras, their own cultural organizations. And that story is told here. The Klarsfeld pillars give some sense of the scale of the loss. There are 2,000 pictures of young Jewish children and families who were deported from France. Most of them were killed at Auschwitz. It allows you to find their names and some details about their life in a book. These weren't just anonymous pictures. These were people with parents and little brothers and pets and homes and lives. The trumpet belonged to Louis Bannett, who was known as the Dutch Louis Armstrong. And in many ways, the trumpet helped to save Louis's life. He played the trumpet in the orchestra at Auschwitz. Itzik Perlman once said, I couldn't play the trumpet to save my life, but Louis Bannett did. Jewish renewal, of course, is one of the most dramatic stories of our time. The fact that men and women who survived the Holocaust were able to rebuild their own lives, but equally important, to rebuild their communities. This didn't happen everywhere. 
certainly it took a long time in some of the areas where the Nazis were successful in destroying Jewish communities. But new lives in the United States, a new country, Israel, and we tell that again through first-person stories. Czech Torah is the last artifact in our core exhibition, and it can serve equally well as the beginning artifact in the exhibition because in some ways it encapsulates the entire story of the museum. The Czech Torah was confiscated by the Nazis. They collected evidence of Jewish life so that they could put these artifacts on display to tell people about the extinguished Jewish race. I think it is an incredible irony, an irony that we all savor, that that artifact is now in an exhibition that Jews created. We also have wonderful galleries, and we fill these galleries with temporary exhibitions. And we also have probably in my view, the most beautiful performance venue, Edmund J. Safra Hall, with all of the state-of-the-art projection and lighting and, and sound equipment. Nearly every week, we have world-class performers, the great scholars of our time, musical groups, consistent with the mission of the museum, but we also try to push the envelope there to do things that are edgy and interesting and that you won't find anywhere else. The Garden of Stones is a profoundly beautiful public space that is open to the sky but within the four walls of the museum. It consists of 18 boulders hollowed out, filled with earth, and from each one grows a small dwarf chestnut oak tree. Andy Goldsworthy's notion was a kind of metaphor for the tenacity of life, that life can take root and flourish even in the most unlikely and unforgiving kinds of environments, a very suitable message for this museum.